We are going to wrap up Acts today with this message uh, in our series, Unshakable, Part 2. And uh, basically what we're going to talk about is being a church that's part of a movement that God has already started. And uh, to go somewhere today, I'll simply say this. For some of you, this is going to be very challenging to you. Uh, I know preparing it, it has been very challenging to me as a leader uh, in the church. Uh, My heart is for Jesus. My heart is for the gospel to continue to go forward. Uh, And I recognize that someday I will die. I just don't know what time that will be. Uh, But if the Lord tarries, I desire Centerpoint Church to also continue. And uh, my heart is that we leave a legacy here, that we follow God uh, with our whole hearts and that we're not living in the past, talking about glory days. So many people share stories about what God did in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, early 2000. But the question simply is this, what is God doing today? Many times if you open up the floor and say, does anybody have a word of testimony they'd like to share where many people run to is, well, back in 1980, when I came to know Jesus as my Savior, that was amazing. But it's 2013. What did God do this week? What did he do? What's so exciting? What did you read yesterday that just got you so excited to follow Jesus, to serve him and love him? We don't want to be a church that goes back to the past and lives in the past. Instead, we want to continue the story of Acts. Are you with me? Acts ends in Acts chapter 28, but our desire is that we would be Acts 29, meaning this, that we just continue the story. Someday Jesus is coming back for his church. Are you excited? I am. I can't wait, right? It's not morbid, like, oh God, kill me today. No, we're not there. But what we're saying is, if I was to die, praise God. It's better to be with him. He's why we're living. If we know him, he's our purpose. He's our meaning. We have a God who's still on mission. Ever read the Bible and go, wow, can't believe that happened. And then you look at your life and you go, why, why can't my life be a story where God is showing up and God is moving and God is working? The good news is it can be. Our churches can be movements instead of what you just heard, museums, that someday those churches will close their doors. Uh, I was driving to Moncton yesterday, drove by two churches. One of them's an antique shop and one of them's a post office. My heart breaks. Why are churches closing their doors? Why are we getting off of our mission? Because God is still on mission. He's still impacting our culture with the gospel. People's lives are being changed even today with the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Here's what starts to happen. In Acts, a movement takes place. And as that movement takes place, people are running to try to organize it, all right? Because here's the thing. When God moves, you have a hard time keeping up. That's the story of the church, right? It's birthed in in Acts. And it is people who are running and they're saying, all right, how do we organize this? How, How do we, in a way, capture what God is doing so that we can capture hearts of more people for the glory of Jesus? The Spirit of God's moving in a powerful way. And and what we see sometimes is churches go from movements to organizing, and then they become institutions. And then if they become institutions, the danger is someday they're going to be museums. Because when you become an institution, what you start to do is you start to talk about the past, about the programs that you love so dearly that today are not being effective for the glory of Jesus. And when we become an institution... We start saying things like, do you remember back when? Man, that that church was really fun to go to, right? 
And, and my heart is that someday, right, when it's 2020, we're not going, man, you remember Centerpoint in 2013? It was so fun to show up here. But instead, in 2020, saying, I can't wait to get to center point to worship Jesus. It's all about Jesus. We want this for our church, for our churches. And if we're not careful, center point, we can become an institution and then a museum. And I hope that captures our hearts today. So the question we need to ask ourselves is do I want to be a part of a movement or do I want to be a part of a museum? Right? And you see this all the time in churches. And, and if you ever ask me, uh, it, it might come down the road, so I'll answer your question right now. So maybe that way you won't ask me down the road. Uh, but center point, the desire is this is just a building. We use this for the glory of Jesus so people can hear about the true message of the gospel. So I'll put it this way. You'll never see my, my picture up on a wall here. Uh, you'll never see plaques on the wall of people who donated stuff to the church. We're not a museum. We're a movement. And uh, I know that that's done sometimes in, in good deed, right, in churches, not knocking that. What I'm saying is this isn't a museum. This is a building that we want God to use to draw people to himself. So if you ever ask me, Howie, can I donate money and you put my name on a chair or something, I will simply say no. <laughs> if you want the chair, buy it and you can take it home. <laughs> and uh, you can sit on it at home. But I'm just answering it ahead of time. Do you want to be part of something that is growing and changing? Or do you want to be something that is dead and not living? That's the question for the church. Do we want to be something that's growing and changing? And here's the thing. When we go to museums, right, many times they're beautiful, they're interesting, they're fascinating. We learn lots of historical facts, right? And Christianity has a lot to learn from museums and from history. But here's the true fact today. It's not about being the museum we can learn from past history, but it's about continuing on with the gospel of Jesus Christ, sharing it, being part of the movement, staying on the mission of God. Here's the heart. We want to see disciples made, right? That's the mission God sent us on. Uh, I, traveling with Josh yesterday to Moncton, I said, it's hilarious because we have a vision, a mission here at Centerpoint Church. We've preached it. We've explained it. But if you are smart, I mean, if you can tear that vision and mission apart, here's what you'll find out. It's in Matthew chapter 28. We didn't create it at all. I said, it's so funny because we put some labels to it, but it's still the same mission to go into all the world, preach the gospel, baptize people, and what? Make disciples. What's a disciple? Well, a disciple is a follower of Jesus. You order your life. You change your life for the glory of Jesus. So the true fact is we want to see disciples and we want to see churches planted. Right when we started Centerpoint Church, we said within the first five years, we want to plant another church. July 7th, we're praying that this can take root and that we can see a church in Charlottetown. We're in year three, so by God's grace, that'll happen. However, this isn't just something Howie and Josh are doing. We're calling us as a church to what? To be part of the mission that God has sent us on. So pray, July 7th, if you haven't clued in, that's like a month away. And we, we set this up so that it has to be God. Church at 3. If you like to sleep in, you got a church to go to at 3 uh, p.m. And uh, pray that God would just open hearts for that. That we would see people in Charlottetown who do not know Jesus come to know Jesus. That's our desire. Today I just feel like I need to tell some of us who are here, some who will be watching this message that some of us, when it comes to the church, we, we need to repent of our attitude. Sometimes we look at the church and our attitude towards the church stinks. 
Some people, believe it or not, they don't come to church because they say, I've been hurt by the church. Can I just tell you, church is made up of imperfect people. You will be hurt. All right? In fact, me as a leader, I will sometimes hurt you. You will hurt me. And this is where grace and love come into play. So don't use the excuse of, well, I don't want to be part of the church because I've been hurt. Instead, look to Jesus. It's not about us. It's never been about us. It's about Christ. So many people I talk to say, Howie, I don't like going to church because back in the past, this is what happened to me. And and I simply say to them, but did Jesus ever do that to you? No. No. Jesus loves you unconditionally. He desires to have fellowship and relationship with you. So the fact simply is we need to repent sometimes of our attitude, of our criticism. I still remember as a 20-year-old going to my fourth year at Bible college and we did an internship uh, and I went to Miramichi, New Brunswick. I showed up at the church and... uh, She's passed away now, so May was her name, that's all I'll say. She came up to me and she said, I just want you to know that I will give you the hardest time you've ever experienced in a church, and I will criticize you, and I'm just being upfront and honest. So I hugged her. (laughs) And I said, nice to meet you, May. Jesus is amazing, Jesus is awesome, and we will serve Jesus together. The fact is some people in the church just have this thing that's not in the Bible and they'll classify it as I just have a gift of criticism, of tearing things apart. Some of us need to repent of our criticism, of our self-righteousness, of our judgmentalism. Some of us need to repent of our suspicion towards leaders. Can I simply say as your leader, my heart is for you? My heart is that you would love Jesus more than you ever have before. And sometimes I will say some hard words to you, but it's because I love you. It's because the Spirit of God has spoken those words to me as well. And any leader who challenges you is a leader worth following in any church. So don't be suspicious of leadership all the time. Many of those pastors and leaders actually have good hearts for you. They do. I know many of them. I meet with many pastors. And the sad thing is, when you put many pastors in a room, what I see is they are just broken. They haven't been encouraged. They don't have a lot of friends. Pray for them, love them, serve them as they serve you on mission as well. Some of us need to repent of our preservation of tradition. Now, I'm not against tradition, right? Many families have tradition. They're all fun. Many churches have tradition. That's fine. However, just don't ride tradition because we always rode it. Are you with me? So if I go, and and I'm not a horse rider myself, All right, I'm allergic to horse hair, so I stay away from horses. But my wife loves horses, and she loves riding horses. And I'd tell you this, if we showed up and there was a dead horse and a living horse, my wife wouldn't jump on the dead horse and say, this is fun. She would jump on the living horse and ride the living horse. Many churches are riding dead horses. Programs that are no longer being effective, but they say, we've always run them. We've always done it. People who lead them, who hold them so closely that if they were to go, they wouldn't know what to do. And churches need to look at this and they need to say, what is change? What is God calling us to? Because at center point, what we like to do with horses that aren't going to live is we like to shoot them. Okay, We do. Let's put it out of its misery. I see churches hanging on all the time to stuff that's tradition, but it's not being effective for the gospel. By the way, we're only three years old and we've already shot a few horses. We did. I always had people coming up, Howie, Howie, 
we want Bible study. We want Bible study. So I said, all right, I'll give you Bible study. First night, 30 people. End of week, four, three people. Bang. It's done. You want Bible study? Go to community group and get in Bible study. Get in community. Are you with me? Thank you. That's good. You need to be faithful. You need to be obedient to what God is calling you to. You need to willingly, personally change. And I always say, thank you, God, for change. And I have to be challenged, too, with change, right? Trust me, if I went to your place and I opened up your photo album and you have pictures from the 80s, you probably look a whole lot different today, or I hope you do. And you say, what? Praise God that I'm not wearing those big glasses, ladies. Remember those things? They're huge. It's like, where's your face? <laughs> All I see is eyes. Where's your face? And, and men, those things called mullets. You remember those? When you, when, <laughs> no, I won't go there. But... <laughs> Aren't you glad that it's 2013, right? So a few months ago, my wife said, Howie, you have had that same hairstyle since 2009. Do you think you could try changing it? I said, absolutely, right? And I showed up at church, and, and I had this comb-over thing going, and I went home, and I said, Cal, I'm really depressed. <laughs> Everyone who likes my hair is from the age of 45 to 70. So, so, so do you mind if I just go back because this is what I like? She said, no problem. I actually like you better with that hair. So I said, praise God. Change is good. Are you with me? Try it sometimes. It's great, right? Now, we want to change as a church so that more people would meet Jesus. Here's what I mean by change. I'm not talking about compromising the word of God. So when I say change, I'm not saying let's preach a lighter message. Let's not push the sin issue. Not going there. We preach Jesus is the only way. We stand on the foundation of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and they are one God. Are you with me? We hold to these fundamentals. We hold them with a closed fist, fist but with other things, we're open-handed, right? And if we change with our culture and our time in that way so that we're relevant with the gospel, we will still see people come to know Jesus through the ministry of Center Point Church. We will. It's bound to happen. We want people to meet Jesus. We don't want 200 years from now people driving into our community so that they can look at Center Point Church and say, remember when that church used to do some good things? But we want them to drive into our community if the Lord tarries and by his grace show up to a Sunday service 200 years from now at Center Point Church. Worshiping Jesus, lifting Jesus high. We want this to be about legacy, about really continuing the mission of Acts. We want Center Point to be alive. We want Center Point to make much of Jesus. We want new people to meet Jesus. We want to leave a legacy. Don't you? We desire to leave a legacy. We want to see generations rise up. In fact, I'm praying that one of the next pastors of Center Point actually comes from Center Point. That he's brought up. There's some young boys here who are really gifted and talented. And we want our men to, to see those boys and pour their life into them so that someday one of those boys is up here preaching the word of God. We want to see our generations involved. We want to see us have some traditions, but not just be sold on our tradition. We want to hand to our children and our children's children a legacy. We want to hand them a living faith. Isn't that what you want to give your kids? 
not a set of rituals, traditions, routines. Why do we go to church? I guess it's just a good thing to do. No, we go to church, family, because Jesus is amazing. And we show up together with people who know Jesus, and we sing. Why do we sing? We sing for the glory of Jesus. Why do we listen to the guy standing at the front? Because he's delivering God's word, and that's what matters. That's what shapes our lives. And then we go out through the week, and we live for Jesus. So mom and dad, why do you read your Bibles? Tell your kids. Read with your kids. Pass on the legacy. Ask yourselves this question. Do I really believe that this church is here for me? Or do I believe that I'm here for God and his people and his mission? And how you answer that question will really show you what direction you're going in. Some people just think the church is here for me and my needs. The reality is the church is about Jesus Christ. It's about his glory. It's about the mission that God has sent the church on. It's not about you. And many people go to churches thinking, I need to choose a church that has a good program for my kids. I need to choose a church that has the preferences I like. How about this? Instead of going with, what can they give me? Ask, what can I give to that church? How can I serve the mission of God in that local church? Is this just a place where we're going to get baptized, bring up our kids, raise our family, and then... Once we show up and put in our time, then maybe we can just show up at Easter and Christmas like everybody else. We don't want that. It's not our desire. Because here's what kills the church. More that we have more consumers than contributors. That's what kills churches. More people who say, give me, rather than what can I give? And if you have more consumers than contributors, churches die. And every church has them. Every church has them. Non-Christians can be consumers. Christians can be consumers. Faithful, dedicated people can be consumers. There are more takers than givers, and that's what can kill a church, when there's more people demanding things than giving money, when there's more people demanding service than volunteering hours. So if we desire Center Point to continue the story of Acts and in a way be in an extension of Acts, because here's the thing, God started the mission. Are you with me? Acts, day of Pentecost, the church was birthed, 120 people in one day became a church of 3,000, 100 and 20 people. Imagine organizing that. The movement of God fell. The church was birthed. This is exciting. In the book of Acts, we've studied it. We've gone through it, and God is still powerful. He just wasn't powerful in Acts. Jesus is still amazing. He just wasn't amazing when he walked the earth doing his ministry. Today, he is still amazing. The Holy Spirit is still at work. Every single Sunday before the service, we go in that back room and we pray. And here's one of our prayers. God, we believe you're sovereign and you will bring the people you want to bring here today to hear the word you want them to hear. We believe that your spirit is drawing people We believe that as we walk through during the week, the Spirit of God is giving us divine appointments constantly where we get to represent Jesus Christ. And here's the thing. If we believe the message of good news, that Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose again, can still change lives, the movement continues. I have been blown away at how the gospel can break hearts, but at the same time, harden hearts. But yet, it's still amazing when you see that life, repent of sin, and embrace Christ as their Savior, and then they order their life for the glory of Jesus Christ. Here's what I want to talk about today. 
because my desire is that we would be a movement, not an institution or a museum. So I have three things I want us to keep in, in mind. This is very easy for you to remember. In fact, I could even do sign language for you today. So if you don't like listening, here's what we're talking about. In order for us to be a movement and not a museum, we need to be upward. See that? Yeah, that's a little charismatic. <laughs> we need to be upward. We need to be inward. And we need to be outward. Upward, inward, outward. Look at that. What did you learn in church today? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Here's Acts chapter 2. I want you to go there. Here's, here's where we're going today. Acts 2, verse 42. And as we wrap up the book, I want us to bring us back here because this is one of the greatest examples of the church in Scripture. Acts 2, 42. Are you there? If you're there, say, got it. Got it. If you're not, say, Wait. And they devoted themselves, verse 42, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and prayers. Here's what we have. We have a picture of the infant church, and they are worshiping. They are a worshiping church. And when I say worshiping, here's what I want to direct us away from. Many people think worship is singing. It's an aspect of worship, but worship covers all of your life. Are you with me? So many people go, oh, the worship was great. I really enjoyed the worship. And what they really mean is this. The singing was great. The praise time was great. But worship, we do it all the time. So Acts 2.42, the early church has this in, that has this spirit of worship. And at our deepest level center point, all of us in this room today, we were created to be worshipers. And the fact is, sin has caused our affections to stray. That's the true reality. So some of us, instead of worshiping our creator God, worship relationships. See this all the time. Men and women, they think, if only I had a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a husband, a wife, my life would be so much better. The reality is, they will not save you. They will be imperfect saviors. So many people worship their relationship. And, and, and this is huge. And, and I worked with teenagers. And I'll simply say, when a teenager was in a dating relationship and that boyfriend or girlfriend broke up with them, they were devastated. Why? Because all of their affection and worth went to the boy, to the girl. You never do that. All your affection and worth as Christ followers go to Jesus. Here's the thing. I love my wife dearly, but Kelsey will not save me. Kelsey, believe it or not, will not even complete me. Jesus has already done that. But he is so good by blessing me with my wife, Kelsey. And we work together as a team. To glorify and honor Jesus. So our marriages are not about each other. It's about Jesus. And in loving Jesus, here's what I've seen. Eight years of marriage, I love my wife more. When I fall more in love with Christ. And my marriage becomes about Jesus, men. It's not about us. My wife will never be able to satisfy and fulfill all of my needs. Your husbands won't be able to do that, wives. Only Jesus can. But if they're loving Jesus, they will love you with a perfect love that comes from Christ. Many people worship relationships. See it all the time in our world today. Many people worship achievement. Achievement. 
they think if only I could make a name for myself and achieve a lot in life, then, then I would be so excited. My life would have so much purpose and meaning. Can I just say to you, if you ever look into it, the millionaires, the billionaires who have achieved are some of the loneliest people you'll ever meet. Many of them are addicted to drugs. Many of them are even taking their own lives. Why? Because money, achievement, popularity does not fulfill. Many people worship their work. Now, work's good. The Bible says we should work. But work should never come above our Savior. Work should never come above our families. Some families, their, their kids and their families don't even know their dad because he loves his work too much. He worships his work. Alfred Elder would say, we gravitate towards control or power or comfort or approval. We obsess about those things. We comfort ourselves with them. We fantasize about them. Biblically speaking, those things are idols. Here's what worship is, and it'll come up on the screen. Worship is pulling our affections off of our idols and putting them on God. That's what worship is. The word worship comes from an old English word that means worth, ship, Okay, this is where we get the term from. Worship can be defined as a private act that has two parts. Seeing what God is worth and then giving him what he deserves. Two acts. God is worthy and since he is worthy, what do I do? That's the question we need to ask ourselves all the time. Job says, I have treasured the words of his mouth. Get this, more than my daily bread. I treasure the words of God more than I do physical food. When I treasure something, I longingly look at it, right? For example, let's just say, I'm going to go big here. Instead of saying, let's go to the Charlottetown Mall, let's go to the West Edmonton Mall. Who's ever been there? Okay, a few of you. Does it beat the Charlottetown Mall? <laughs> okay, so you're with me. So we go to the West Ed Mall, and we are walking through there, and there are stores galore. Now, I have a wife who loves to shop. Any men with me? Do you wait in the car while she goes in? <laughs> Now, what I do sometimes is this, right? We work off of a budget as a couple, and sometimes when I go through the mall, I basically try to run through it with Kelsey because I know we're on a budget and we need to keep our budget. But here's the thing. You go to the West Side Mall, and all of a sudden you look over, and you are just blown away, right? I can't believe that's out. I've been waiting for that for so long. There it is. And then you start just, in a way, let's use a good PI word, gawking at it. And you're like, I just wish I had it. And then you don't buy it because you're going to walk and you're going to think about it. And then while you're walking, you just keep talking about it. Okay? For example, this is how it always, always happens. Okay? So I'm at the gym. This is a few months ago. And uh, there's some guys there, and they're lifting some heavy weight. And I go, man, I would love to lift heavier weight. And one of the guys says, Howie, it's easy. Here, just try this. And here's what he gave me. He, he gave me one of these, all right? Now, I got teased bringing this in today because they're like, is that your heavyweight title? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I've held it since I was nine years old. I haven't lost it yet. No, but a guy, the guy said, just try this weight belt. We'll guarantee you'll be able to squat 50 more pounds. And when I put this belt on, what I found out is it's, it holds everything in. My back's really straight. All right, are you with me? So when you go to squat, your back stays, it stays straight because of the belt. And I tried it, and I was like, that's awesome. And he's like, yeah, you can use it for the rest of your workout. Just put it right at the front when you're done. I said, thanks so much. 
And I went home and supper that night. I said, Kelsey, I tried this weight belt at the gym. It's amazing. Except, do you think I could get one? My birthday's coming up. <laughs> and she said, okay, if that's what you want, then that's what you can get. So I went and I got a weight belt. I bring it all the time. And I put it on just to show Kelsey. And she's like, you wear that in public? <laughs> Here's what happens. You ponder it, right? You ponder the virtues of it. And if you're wondering what ponder is, it simply means you think about it. What are the values of it? And then you start talking about it. And then you take that step and you go and what? Buy it. Now, worship, and, and bringing this back now, worship is treasuring God, meaning this. I ponder his worth, I think about it, and then I do something about it. That's worship. I give him what he's worth. And every approach to worship will have these two elements. Value the worth, and then you do something about it. All the time. In Acts, they worship together in the temple. To bring it into our context, this is our Sundays. We gather together. We worship together. They ate together. This is what we're trying to encourage you to do. Uh, be part of community group. Show up at someone's house. And guess what happens many times? There's food. And you eat together and you talk together. They ate together. What else it says here is that they remembered the bread and the wine that remembered the Lord's death. We do this every Sunday at the front and at the back. And my encouragement to you is this. If you know Jesus, partake and be a part of that because Christ has changed your life. You celebrate that. If you have kids, my encouragement to you, talk to your kids about what this is. So they don't get confused. Is this a, 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 a mid-lunch snack? No, it's not a snack. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Do you know Jesus? Ask your sons and your daughters. Do you have a relationship with Jesus? Teach them about what communion is. In the church in Acts, love and worship was always there. Would you agree? You've seen this. They loved and they worshipped. Love and worship go hand in hand. It's the highest priority of a follower of Jesus. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, we read this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. That's what we call the Old Testament Shema. Okay, they, they quoted this often. They said this often. This was a call to love and worship. It was arranged to make sure that the followers, the people of God would be fit worshipers. And in Acts, the Spirit of God shows up at Pentecost. He falls down. Now there's no longer structures needed. Because here's the thing, right now, you and I, we worship all the time. Meaning this, I dropped Josh off yesterday at his parents so he could uh, get his wife and family. And I drove home, and after Josh got out of the truck, I cranked my music. And here's what I did, an aspect of worship. I sang just like the band that was playing. <laughs> And if I was the judge, I would have been like, you need to sign a contract. You are amazing. And I didn't even care yesterday because it was raining and my truck windows fogged up because of the humidity. And I sang even at the red light. <laughs> when you look over and you go, what are they doing? <laughs> and it was like right there in my 05 Ranger, I was worshiping God. It was awesome. We are all worshipers all the time. Worship is always a distinctive of a church that refuses to become a museum. Worship is always a distinctive. The huge tragedy of the church today is this. Most people worship their work, their job, 
their money. And here's what they do. They work at their play. So they buy stuff and things, toys, many times. And they play at their worship. Jesus becomes a tack on. And men, many times you think church is a place for women and children. When actually it's a place for you. And if you don't show up in the church, churches will close their doors. A.W. Tozer says, We have lost our spirit of worship and our ability to withdraw inwardly to meet God in adoring silence. Modern Christianity is simply not producing the kind of Christian who can appreciate or experience the life in the spirit. The words, be still and know that I am God, mean next to nothing to self-confident, bustling worshipers. Be still and know that I am God. Can I just say, if you're here today and you're struggling, did you ever just stop? And sit in quietness before God and allow the Spirit of God to speak to your heart. Here's what I'm seeing over and over in the church. Crisis comes and then we start to try to control it and figure it out. And when we do that, we start justifying why we're not following God the way we should be. Where if only we would have stopped and heard from God for direction. That's where we we should go and then make our moves. Here's how you make decisions. You pray, first of all, that God would give you wisdom. Bible says, if you don't have wisdom, ask me for wisdom. I'll give you wisdom. So you need to make a decision. Stop and pray and ask God, God, give me wisdom. And then here's what you do. You bring in wise counsel. People who love you, who aren't afraid to push and challenge you, right? Because sometimes we have those people in our life and we say, here's what I'm doing. They're like, oh, that's awesome. That's great when it's actually stupid. And what you need is someone to say, hey, stupid. Don't do it. And what we do to those friends is we go, well, they're not really my friend because they're not supporting me. When actually they really love you and they're telling you the truth. So we pray for wisdom. We bring in wise counsel of other people. And then here's what we find out. There's so many choices. Are you with me? There's door after door. And Kelsey's dad always says this. He always tells Kelsey, just try the handles until the door opens. And when the door opens, walk through it. It's how you make choices in your life. Pray, ask wisdom, bring in wise counsel. Be challenged by some friends in your life who just aren't saying yes to everything that you think is amazing and great. Some of you are like, man, I need new friends. (laughs) And yeah, you might need new friends. We show up at church, and we seldom slow down enough, right? You come into here. Who had a busy week? All right. Normally, right, all of us would say this. How are you doing? Well, I'm um, busy. It's, it's number one on the how you're doing response list. Um, busy. Okay. Can we just solve this? You're busy. I'm busy. Priorities are the key. Priorities are the key. So you come into church off of a busy week, and here's what many times happens. We start to pray, and you're like, yes, I finally get to shut my eyes. And you start thinking about what happened this week and what's coming this week, and you don't really pray. You don't thank God. You don't reflect upon God. What else happens is we start to sing songs. Can I just tell you, singing is an opportunity for you to go into neutral, by the way. 
Two months ago, I'm driving up Bells Hill in my fast little truck, and there's this car going super slow, and I'm like, I need to pass the car. So I put my foot down, and I have it to the floor, and I'm going like 80. <laughs> and then it slowly, slowly starts to pick up speed, and I get to the top of Bells Hill, and I take my foot down to come back to 80, and what happens is my truck just keeps picking up speed. And all of a sudden, I'm fully engaged. <laughs> my truck's now 110. It's now 120. And here's the thing. If you don't know anything about trucks or cars like myself, people along the road of your life had said, they, they've said a few things to you. Like, I heard this when I was a teenager. Never turn off your car or truck when it's in drive because your transmission will blow. So I'm driving. I'm now at 1.30 and I'm like, I can't turn my truck off. So I put my foot on the brake. I'm coming in. I'm, I'm by the old shell. It's where Deborah Tweedy's office is. And I am fully engaged and I am praying. God, I'm praying out loud. God, please don't let anyone pull out in front of me. I'm going to hit them. My foot's on the brake. Both feet are on the brake. And I'm going 50. I got it down to 50. And I'm like, all right, I need to turn somewhere. And finally, I hit Petro Canada, and by God's grace, nothing came in front, nothing stopped. And I rounded that turn at 50, thought I was going to roll my little white truck, and uh, it came back down. And then I started driving up Robertson Road, and I started saying, praise you, God. This is a road where hardly any cars are on unless you're the Clory family driving home. <laughs> And I'm going up Robertson Road, and I said, I just need to stop this. So finally, I said, I just need to do it. And I turned my key, and I put my truck into neutral. And guess what happened? It stopped. And I'm like, why didn't I do that earlier? Now, here's what I want to say. Some of us come, and we throw it into neutral right away. But in that experience, here's what I realized. I was fully engaged. I've never been more aware of traffic in my life. Ever drive somewhere and go, oh, I, I don't even remember driving here. <laughs> That's safe. <laughs> but I was fully engaged. I seen everything. I seen everybody. And here was the reality. When we come to worship God, it's dangerous. If I sing... And what if they think, man, he can't sing? I would then tell you, if they ever say that to you, come stand beside me, because I will make you sound really good. <laughs> Fully engage. Don't slip into neutral. Worship God with everything you have. Even you have these things. Raise them. Whoa. They lift up like this. Ever get so joyous in your heart? Ever been to a hockey game or watch the Bruins on TV? And when they win, I bet you're not sitting on the couch going, finally. You're up and you're screaming. Are you with me? Why? Because you're a worshiper. And then you go to your car and you're flying Boston Bruins flags from them. And I... It's just a sign, when, when you park at Superstore, I'm pulling up beside you. Whoops! It's a joke. We wouldn't do that. Congratulations, Bruin fans. Here's, here's what I'm saying. Worship will always engage you fully. You will be into it no matter what we're doing in the church. How about preaching? Sometimes preaching is like a time where oh, I got to endure it, got to make it through, right? I drank three coffees so I wouldn't fall asleep through Pastor Howie's sermon. I got to endure. Yeah, persevere, persevere. But isn't God's word amazing? Right? I wake up every morning, go to my office, and the first thing I like to do is read. Spend time with God. Guess what? 
sometimes in the evening, there's this thing that happens and it goes, it'd be so awesome to read the Word of God again. So we what? We read the Word of God again. But how you already did it in the morning. Yeah, I'm doing it again. It's awesome to be in God's Word. To know that the God of the universe speaks to us. And he says he does it most times through his what? Word. Why wouldn't we be in the word? Worship is, let's talk about some of this. It's repentance. It's repentance. Worship does not become worship until it changes the way we live. Worship is intellectual. We're called to worship the Lord with our minds by renewing them and fixing them on him. Colossians 3.2. Worship is intentional. It's relational. Put it this way, guys. If you are a jerk to your wives, you will not truly worship God. Are you with me? Ever have those Sundays? You get in a disagreement with your spouse? I'm the preacher, and I get those Sundays. And I'm praying. I'm like, God, you really need to help me through this because we need to work through some things, and we do. But ever have those Sundays? The kid's driving you nuts, and you're driving to church, and you're like, let's turn the car around. Worship is relational. Worship includes many things. It includes praise, proclamation, service, participation, sacrifice, and submission. Now, second thing, that was upward. Let's talk about inward. Unshakable by focusing inward leads to care for the body of Christ, the church. Here's what I simply want to say out of Acts 2.42 and to verse 47. In the church, they were helping each other and caring for each other. Are you with me? Someone had a need. The church helped meet the need. And I just want to help you here. Here's the thing. People have needs all the time. And I'll say this as a pastor. I have many people who will write me, who will call me, and they'll say things like, can you give me money? I have this need. I don't control the finances of Centerpoint Church. Josh doesn't. It's it's safe that way. Trust me. So if you have needs, here's what I'd encourage you to do. At times as a church, we help people in need, right? We do this. We give away something like $5,000 in total last year to helping people in need. So we do help people at Centerpoint Church. However, we're praying it through too because some people just use the church. They manipulate the church. And if my heart truly loves you, the last thing I want to do is throw money at you so you can just go squander money. Instead, we want to say, how can we help you get grounded financially? And you really find out the people who are committed to getting this right. What do you mean I need to have a budget now? Yeah, you need to start managing money. God's blessed you, let's manage it well. Do you give? Do you tithe? There's a good question. They say the last thing to be saved on a Christian is their wallet or their purse. Do you tithe? Do you give towards God? He owns it all. Do you worship him that way? And what I find is many people who are in the church, who are using the church, don't give. Don't give of their time, their talent, their treasure. And then they expect the church to just hand them things. They would hurt you if they did that. And in the book of Acts, what you have is fully engaged followers of Jesus who when someone's in need, for example, a single mom with three kids who's busting her butt and working hard to pay for groceries and cover clothing for her kids. And it's January and she can't put oil in her furnace. And she shows up and she says, hey, I I don't have any money for oil. Could you help me? We go, absolutely. Absolutely. The people who are, you know, I could work there. I just don't want to work there. But you have no job. I don't like that job. You need money. Go work. And while you're working, look for another job. Well, I'm going to go out west. When? 
It's been a year. And I speak to young men. They do this all the time. And ladies, find a man who loves Jesus and then has a job. If he loves Jesus, he will not take advantage of you. We focus inward. We love and we care for the body of Christ. The last thing is this. We focus outward. We focus outward. Did you see how the missions happened in Acts? They started where? In Jerusalem. Then went to where? Samaria and Judea. And after that, it says, chapter 12 to 28. I hope I've taught you well. They went where? To the rest of the world. They started locally, branched out, and then they went globally. And they turned the world upside down for the glory of Jesus. This is how missions is done. It starts here. In our community. Are we on mission in Montague? Are we on mission in Eastern PEI? Are we on mission on, in the province of Prince Edward Island in general? And then we go where? We go out to the world. We go globally. This is how Acts has painted it. We must put all we have in the hands of Jesus. And when we do that, here's what he does. He uses us in his way, in his time, for his glory. It's beautiful to be used for the glory of Jesus. So we invade the darkness. We care more about the lost than we do our personal comforts. Are you with me? Anybody have personal likes in here? Right? Okay. I always have someone after service trying to get... That's why you don't know. I lived in Winnipeg. I locked my doors all the time. They tried to get in my truck to put it on the country station so that when I started up, there's country. My preference is I don't listen to country, but I'll tell you this. I love Peter McDougal. I do. I love him. I love his passion for Jesus. I love that he uses his music for the glory of Jesus. And if I had to sit through Peter McDougal 365 days a year to see people come to Christ, I would. Because we lay aside our preferences for the gospel, for the glory of Jesus. I always have people coming. Howie, are you trying to reach young people? And I say, yeah, but we're also trying to reach younger, younger people and older, older people as well. But we don't cater to what? Preferences. So I've had people in the history of Centerpoint Church come to me and they say things like this. Howie, if we don't sing more hymns, then we're leaving. So I say, can I pray with you that you find a good church to go to that sings hymns if that's what you want? Because there's a church on every corner. Some of them sang all hymns today for the glory of Jesus. Praise God. Some didn't even sing a single hymn. And there'll be people who would go, that's just a contemporary church. They've compromised everything. No, they still love Jesus. We lay aside our preferences as we go outward. Acts 28, Paul is meeting with people. They're coming to his place where he's staying, and he starts explaining the gospel. And, and here's really what he gets at. Jesus said this, and we'll close with this verse. In Matthew 13, verses 14 and 15, he says this, and this is Jesus speaking. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, you will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn. And here's what Jesus says, and I would heal them. Here's the last thing I'll say as we conclude the book of Acts. Paul looks at some of those in Acts 28, and he basically tells them, your heart has become dull. And he quotes the prophet Isaiah. In the Greek, it means this, your heart has become fat. That's the Greek. Ever see a heart 
surrounded by fat. It's constricted. It's unhealthy. And spiritually speaking, here's what Paul is saying to these people. You are religious, but your heart is fat, meaning this. There are other things besides Jesus Christ that is constricting your heart. It's keeping you from Jesus. And the sad fact is it says that many of them walked away and did not believe. And right there, their chapter of the story, it ended. They walked away. Some of us, by God's grace, you come into this church and week after week you hear about Jesus. And week after week you still leave not knowing Jesus. And your heart has become fat. It's constricted. There's other things that you are worshiping that you value higher than Jesus. What we need to do is repent of those idols. And here's the good news. Acts 28 says, There were some who heard and were persuaded. And they had lean and vital hearts. And they lived their life for the glory of Jesus. And here's what happened. Their lives continued the story of Acts. The movement goes on. Here we are today, 2,000 years removed And guess what? It's still going. God is still pushing his mission. Center point, may we be a church that continues the story. And I'll close with this last line. These people's lives were not museums, but movements. They continued the story and they became unshakable. Let's pray.